right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, episode of Alchemical Church. Today, we're talking with a very good friend and a mentor, a colleague, a teacher of mine, Robert Allen Bartlett. Um, those of you who have listened to me talk about alchemy in the past uh, have probably heard me talk about Robert and his works. Anytime anybody asks me, what book should I pick up to learn more about laboratory alchemy? I always suggest one or both of these books. Uh, first is Real Alchemy, Primer, uh, Primer of Practical Alchemy, and the other one is The Way of the Crucible. Both of these for what almost last decade or so have been absolute staples um, for laboratory work because they in very plain English spell out a lot of the more practical processes of alchemy. And of course, you know, Robert has run the uh, Spagyricus School of Alchemy here for, God, a good number of years, probably going on 20 years or more. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of recent works and recent developments that he's been up to. So I'm very excited to bring him on the show. Robert Bartlett, welcome to Alchemical Germain. Oh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to see you again, Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, man, you too. It's It's been a very long time since I've actually seen you in person. I think the last time I saw you was on over my birthday weekend in 2015 or something like that. So it's yeah, been a while. Yeah. Quite a while. So you should come for a visit. <laughs> yeah, I would like to actually. I just to escape the heat here in the summertime. Although I understand up in the Pacific Northwest, you guys have also had a heat wave this summer. Yeah, for here it was 107. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty hot. That's kind of what we're used to down here in Utah. But you know, yeah. again, if I leave here, I I want to escape the heat. <laughs> we actually may take a road trip down your way um, this summer. Oh, really? Later in the fall. Uh, oh, brilliant. Do you have some work that's bringing you down this way? I have to meet up with Angela. Oh, um, excellent. Is she going to be donating <laughs> a lot of the the materials that she has to you and to Spagyricus? Yeah, apparently she has boxes of materials for me and some equipment uh, she's been holding. So best way to get it is to go there and physically get it all. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a lot cheaper probably in the long run over shipping too. Oh, but yeah, uh, yeah uh, invaluable materials like that, you can't just, ha you know, expect that the mail is going to deliver them and have them end up lost. So yeah. for those of you who are listening, Angela Riedel is the daughter of, well, I don't know, her, her married name is not Riedel, but uh, that was her maiden name. It was the daughter of Frater Albertus from uh, the Paracelsus Research Society. And that's actually Robert, where you, I can't say you got your start with alchemy, but that's where you got your professional, your professional start with alchemy was working with uh, Frauder way back in, was it the 80s or the, the late 70s that you started with him? I took my prima class in uh, 1974. 1974. Wow, that's awesome. And did you and then, go through all seven of the years of curriculum with him? Yeah, yeah. But I had graduated already in 79. Frater Albertus told me to go back to school and finish my degree in, in chemistry, which I had suspended uh, from San Jose State um, to go to the PRS, you know, and I devoted my time pretty much full time to that. Um, but he told me to go back to school and I'd have plenty of work waiting for me when I got out. And that was the best advice ever really. <laughs> so I did that and I ended up becoming the uh, chief chemist at Paralab in 1979. Wow. Now, during that time, I'm sure that you were working probably closer in the lab with Frauder than any of the students up to that point, because he was actually sharing information with you on how he wanted production done for Paralabs, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's we'd, amazing. We'd have meetings. Sometimes he'd be out there in the lab with me. Um, there were periods, too, when he was gone, you know, for months teaching in Europe or Australia. And so he'd come back and want to see the progress. And I, I remember one occasion I had this big flowchart drawn out on the lab bench, and I had 
taken all the process samples of antimony from the raw ore, you know, through the glass and the extractions and yada yada, all the intermediaries to the final tincture. You know, I had it all laid out there, and and uh, I had done some analytical stuff on the material using uh, thin layer chromatography. It's all we really had access to, you know. Yeah. So I did what I could, do some solution analysis and thin layer chromatography. And, and when Frater came back and saw it all, he got really excited and he, he said, this is as far as we've ever gotten, you know, and um, he told me to keep, keep gathering information like this, you know, because it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and it won't be taken seriously medically until, you know, they can look at such data. And so uh, that's kind of been what I've been doing for the last 50 years, <laughs> gathering <laughs> information every time I come across a, a piece of equipment in my in my jobs you know I have access to high-tech equipment and I uh, filter in some of my samples and run analyses on them um, over the years you know if I had had to pay for all this and not done it myself Cost uh, prohibitive yeah uh, it, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, by today's prices um, in now or so much more, depending on what you're looking on. I know that, you know, whenever we'll make a, a product for a client, we usually have to send it in just to get the microbiologicals and, you know, heavy metal analyses and other things like that done, you know, yeah. depending on the lab that we send it to and, and the complexity of it, just that alone is, you know, in surplus of seven to $800 for, you know, just a, just one single item. And then when you start talking about, you know, recently we sent in some samples to check for graphene oxide, that alone was $500 to check for uh, the presence of strophanthin, G-strophanthin um, in a product, that was another five to $700. And so it becomes super cost prohibitive. And that's kind of the barrier that has existed realistically from my perspective between alchemy, alchemical substances, or even spagyric medicines, which in my opinion, anything that is an alchemical medicine tends to be able to be used in spagyric pharmacopoeia. It's just not looked at or talked about that way these days. People tend to relinquish spagyria to herbal uh, alchemy, which I think is a great disservice to Paracelsus and the enormous pharmacopoeia he built. But yeah, so that's why I personally find your work so fascinating is because you have years and years and years of, you know, like you said, 50 years of data built up around things that you have made and then analyzed, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I can, I've been able to follow things like, well, the oil of gold, you know, from freshly prepared, maybe one year old, um, and then, you know, five 10, 20 years later, how's the same exact sample of oil of gold handled aging? You know, 30 years old, 40 year old gold oil. Yeah. Uh, the same sample analyzed, you know, at different points through time to see what types of changes have gone on. Um, they do mature like wine. So they become very complex and um, have very nice subtleties that develop. Well, one of the things I've noticed too, especially with any of the pyrolytic methods for producing oil of gold from, from the acetates, which by the way, was one of the papers that I inherited from Viola Engel that you had written many years ago as part of PRS was uh, the thermal decomposition of the metal acetates. That's where I learned to, to do the process. So with all of that work, what I notice is that typically there's a lot of settling, no matter how well you vacuum filtered initially, there are things that precipitate out over time. Um, and those typically tend to be black or, you know, dark brown in color and stuff, which would indicate to me that there are subtle toxicities inside of the materials that eventually will precipitate out given enough time. Can you talk about that and, and kind of share some of your experience? Uh, well, Isaac Holland talks a lot about them. He, he describes them as the combustible oil, uh, generally undesirable. Um, and like you say, it probably contains uh, carcinogens. Uh, uh, there are ways to purify it, you know, and make it suitable for, they use it externally for rheumatism and arthritic pains uh, as a liniment after preparation, but 
but he also describes it as a source for the um, the volatile salts because when you're up that high mm -hmm. that oil coming over it's it's you're up five six hundred degrees uh, yeah. c um, if not more so you're at the end of the distillation pushing everything out that will come out under high temperature and the salts the volatile salts get incorporated into that oil and they come over with it if you gather all that oil and um, shake it with water and then separate the oil and the water layers and crystallize the water you'll see the volatile salts remaining um, so there's there is a use for it <laughs> if you get the volatile salts which are are themselves very powerful uh, as you know yeah <clears throat> the, yeah that's, uh, that's actually a huge part of the quote unquote hidden works or the the esoteric work behind that gold is being able to gather those volatilized salts or volatile salts. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that that's absolutely fascinating. When, when you check your fresh oil of gold that you make, you know, or that was made that you had done analytics on, were you finding high amounts of sesquiterpenes inside of there? What, what, was, what was your analysis? What's, what does the composition kind of look like to you? Uh... It's complex. I, I wouldn't. I didn't get a full terpene scan on it. Um, one one compound that sticks out in my mind was coronine. Huh. Uh, as a fairly major component, which coronine is, uh, you know, you have a, a benzene ring. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a ring of benzene rings. Oh wow. And you can imagine the chemical energy is taking a, an acetone, take two acetones and bend them, stick them together to make a benzene ring, and then take those rings and bend them into a ring. It takes a lot of energy to do that. And, and to do that synthetically in the lab is, is very difficult. But here it is, you know, Morgana. catalytically <laughs> produced uh, very quickly, so. Wow, that's that's really fascinating. Now, something I've never done, which has been a little cost prohibitive on my uh, on my portion to do, is to be able to take the oil of gold and actually use it as a solvent for the extraction of you know other minerals, metals, herbs, etc., and in various forms. Is that something that you've had the opportunity to play around with? And and do you have anything that you would like to say about that? I haven't done that uh, it's it's hard to tell the the tincture you know if you have a tincture from using a, an already tinctured extraction media you know um, now i've combined it with different oils uh, you yeah. know and, and we have had some naturopathic um, feedback we had a naturopath um, north of us here and one of his assistants took classes with us and, and he was interested in Paracelsus, you know, and he wanted to try some of the medicine. So um, he tried some of the gold oil and found it was uh, very effective in mercury poisoning. So I thought that was a, a very interesting take on that. Wow, that is interesting. I'm I'm not certain what the pathway would be or why that would be effective for removing heavy metallic mercury. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, just uh, I mean the affinity of gold and mercury. Uh, right. Naturally, you know uh, they use mercury to pan for gold. You know it will yeah. form an amalgam quickly, but but there is no metallic gold in the oil of gold, so it's something else, uh, an energetic connection they have. Uh, wow. The, the pathway, the enzymatic pathways and other things that could possibly cause that are really interesting to me. And does this naturopath that you're talking about actually use this in a clinical setting for mercury? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. That is but his, uh, his partner, uh, his partner kind of freaked out because we're not a certified lab, so he uh, yeah he had to stop testing on it. You know, um, to become a certified lab, you've got to jump through all kinds of hoops and, and yeah. lab preparations and uh, exactly. licensing. So 
Well, and that's yeah. that's we're a, more school and still restricts me too is the CGMP certifications. I mean, your warehouse has to have, you know, these areas where everything's put, a, and we have a bunch of fireproof safes and we have well ventilated rooms. Um, I don't have a really up to standard uh, ventilation hood here though. And they require very specific, you know, standards for things like that. And, you know, the tapes on the floor of where people can be in the hair nets. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just crazy. It, it's basically cost prohibitive for anybody that doesn't have pharmaceutical or nutraceutical investment to be able to get into yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and we're just a, a little ma and pa store. <laughs> yeah. right? We're more a school than a, a production lab, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that was one of the things, in fact, your, your work, when I, when I started studying with you, I think this was, you know, 2012 or something when I started coming up and, and I, of course I had seen you at the Alchemy conferences earlier and just kind of had my mind blown. But I think the first time that I had worked with you was in 2012. And, you know, you showed me, you took myself and, and my buddy Reg into your office and you showed us these <laughs> huge stacks of analytical materials, I thought, oh my God, that's just going to be so invaluable to the, to the entire world here before long. And ever since then, I've been trying to get my hands on materials to be able to do very similar things, because I think that, you know, having, having one person producing all of this data is absolutely good. But as you know, there's going to have to be peer review before anything is able to actually be, you know, solidified yeah, yeah. For, for the future of, of medicine. Um, so exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and the products are so unique. I mean, a lot of my analyses are, are really just fingerprints. You know, here's here's the oil of gold under uh, gas chromatography or or under infrared scan, you know, or a, a thermal. Uh, uh, thermogram. <laughs> differential thermogram. Um, lots of different analyses of materials and they're more just fingerprints, you know, um, yeah. a lot of times I can't say that, <clears throat> you know, this contains this and this and this, you know, the full scan because uh, a lot of the equipment didn't have libraries that I could access. And so I have scans that need interpretation. Which is important uh, because, you know, typically if I, if I'm not mistaken, this is true of pretty much all of the different forms of, analytical chemistry is that typically hundreds of items need to be able to be scanned in or, or the same item needs to have say a hundred different scans to it or so. And then there's always going to be some sort of slight differences between the way that it comes up. Uh, and yeah. so what typically ends up happening is that there is an average or a median taken between the levels and then that is used as the analytical standard is that kind of the way that it works yeah yeah and especially in this kind of case you know it, it could differ by source material you know say i got some antimony from hungary and you got antimony from china and we made yeah. tinctures and they're both very similar but there's little oddities about this one or that one um so differences even like that um, Similar to with plants, you know, you pick mm -hmm. a plant in in California is quite different from you know picking the same plant in you know uh, Iowa or somewhere yeah. out in the middle yeah. of the country. So there could be differences in tinctures that way, but they do have you know they link up. You know the the Iowa plants are going to show up just like the California plants, but there's nuances uh, that differentiate them. Man, that's absolutely so fascinating. We're coming upon the, the time to take our first break here, but when we come back, let's dive a little bit more into this, um, into some of the problematic aspects of why alchemy, alchemical pharmacopoeia historically, and also spagyria, specifically uh, Paracelsian and um, Valentinian uh, type of works are not really seen today as, as valid medicines and some of the things that stand in their way besides just analytics. And uh, I think that that'll make for a good conversation. So, all right, stay tuned, folks. We'll be back here in just a sec. Are you looking for the highest quality herbal supplements and remedies for your home apothecary? Or maybe you're looking to take your spellcraft, magical workings, or offerings to the next level. 
Whatever your reasons might be, we have hundreds of verbal Spagyric items available, and every purchase supports our work and helps bring Spagyria into the light of the modern world. Here at the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy, we produce dozens and dozens of items of Spagyric Pharmacopoeia each year, even though we only need a few samples for our research purposes. So the remaining quantities are available to the public in our online Spagyric Apothecary. Only the highest quality natural, organic, biodynamic, and ethically wildcrafted materials go into our products, and every purchase you make helps fund our research. As an Alchemiculture podcast listener, you can get your hands on our professionally crafted small batch spagyric products for 15% off using coupon code LISTEN15. So go ahead and browse our enormous selection of products and get yourself something new or pick up one of your favorite products today. Visit phoenixaurelius.org slash apothecary and enter coupon code LISTEN15 to take 15% off your entire order. And thanks in advance for supporting our research. Welcome back, folks. We are joined again by Robert Allen Bartlett. Uh, before the break, we were just kind of chatting a little bit of shop talk about uh, alchemy and, and uh, some alchemical substances, specifically oil of gold and its changes as it matures over the years and some of the volatile salts and other things. But, you know, that really brings us into talking about some of the things that are actually standing in the way between alchemical medicines, historical alchemical medicines, and specifically spagyric medicines of the Paracelsian and Valentinian tradition um, being recognized by United States, European, Indian pharmacopias. Um, you know, of course, there are things uh, like electro homeopathy today that, you know, they take, uh, you know, Count Cesare Mattei and others, they take, um, you know, certain substances kind of perform what I would even consider to be a quasi spagyric process on it and then homeopathically dilute it. And even though there are applications there, and even though in Indian, most European countries and the United States pharmacopoeia all acknowledge electro homeopathy, that is in such a homeopathic dilution that it's really not even of the same caliber as most alchemical medicines, spagyric medicines were actually historically written about. So from your perspective, Robert, what are, what are some of the barriers that still stand in the way between, you know, modern pharmacopoeia acknowledgement of today and the medicines where we have them at the present moment? Uh, education. Um, there's always been problems with spagyrics. One is the length of time it takes to make things was a big hang up. Um, in fact, that's why Glauber, Rudolf Glauber, around 1685, he developed what he calls his philosophic furnaces to speed up a lot of the processes. They, they call him the first uh, industrial chemist because he scaled up processes that took you know, a long time. And to supply a big city like London with spagyric remedies, uh, it's very difficult to keep oh, up yeah. with demand oh, yeah. with the length of time it takes to do extractions and, and on, you know, calcinations, combining, maturing, all that takes time. Um, so you would have a stock, you know, going and, and that would be you know, how you'd have to operate smaller scale. There are still uh, spagyric pharmacies in Germany, I know yeah. of. Yeah. Um, they're small scale. Um, and in India, they, they still have their preparations available. Um, they use uh, Bosmas right. in a lot of their Rasa, Rasa Shastra uh, materials, which is Indian alchemy, uh, but they're largely prohibited from import to the US because um, the FDA has noted that there's sometimes mercury or arsenic present and in the preparation. So they have yeah. pretty much prohibited import. Uh, although India is cracking down and making uh, changes to their, um, <clears throat> their system of drug manufacture. Uh, people have to register now, it's like, you know, there are types who would make a preparation and say, yeah, this is, uh, you know, the uh, bosom of gold, but it's loaded with mercury or arsenic, which was used in the preparation. You know, yeah. ultimately that should not be there. 
uh, when it's properly prepared. Um, so they're cracking down on people who are taking shortcuts and uh, testing their materials. In a way, they're, they're ahead of us, you know, as far as getting uh, approval for our chemical medicines. Um, here in the US, um, it's, it's still people don't know um, about spagyrics. They don't know the difference, uh, I don't think. Um, they understand herbs and they understand herb tinctures, but they don't understand the magic that happens when you add the salts. Um, you know, you go to the health food store, you know, you buy a tincture of uh, stinging nettle, say, they've taken the stinging nettle and done an extraction for maybe a couple of days, filtered out the herb and thrown it out or fed it to the hogs, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and bottled the tincture. So you have two parts of a three part being. <laughs> you don't have the body, so it's not grounded. You'll get effects, but they'll be more ethereal, more um, subtle. The body brings it down and potentizes it to physical strength. Um, and I've seen it time and time again in classes. You know, we always have people who, who do dowsing or they have pendulums or muscle testing. And right at the point where we add the salts into the tincture, boom, something happens. It's like a quantum leap in, in the potency of the medicine just skyrocketed. You know, I'm measuring it with my pendulum and it's, you know, going feebly around and all of a sudden it's like yeah. flying yeah. around here, perpendicular, um, <laughs> ready to take off just by that simple act. So um, I think it's largely education. People have to um, know about the products. Um, Case in point, we had um, someone who was interested in using the oil of gold in their products, but their their backers, who had all the money in pool, didn't want to have anything to do or mention of the A word, you know, <laughs> alchemy, or or the even more obscure spagyric. Yeah. Word. Uh, and so ultimately she had to change the description around so far that it was, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was, uh, she was selling it as 24 karat gold, metal free liquid gold minerals. Oh, no, that doesn't even make sense though. That like, yeah. when you talk about it like that, it's preposterous. Yeah. Well, she couldn't wrap her head around a simple word, catalyzate. Ah, uh, yeah. To help explain it, you know, in a scientific form, but, but so she ended up with that, you know, and that kind of crashed her whole product line. I think after that. Oh, I bet. I yeah. I mean, that's that's going to make absolutely no sense to the general uh, public. The the marketability on that just went way yeah, down. Yeah, no, it was a, it was crazy. Um, you know, so there hard. there are some good things that I've seen though. I mean, there's. There's a lot of uh, people, I mean, myself included, that are starting to get spagyria more noticed. Of course, you know, I take the same route that Frotter took and that you take and that, you know, I, I was heavily inspired by you both of doing research on these materials. And so, you know, we have hundreds of items of spagyric pharmacopoeia over here at the present moment. And um, I've got, you know, metallic things, mineral things. Uh, I don't have so many animal things, but I do have a few and um, a ton of, of herbal items. And I'm taking that same approach as being able to do what analytics that I can. Um, one of the things that we've started doing is an intrinsic data field analysis, which is a very forward thinking type of quantum scalar analysis. And it doesn't give us, like there are industry standards to it, but it doesn't give us the same type of uh, results in terms of like parts per million, parts per billion, et cetera, that a lot of analytical chemistry does, but it does show us like we can take a look at percentages of things inside of a, a material and we can approximate how many parts per billion that must be and things like that. But it's just like you were saying with quantification of things, it, you know, we can take an herbal tincture that we made with the exact same material, the exact same, you know, the same ethanol, the same herb batch grown in the exact same location, harvested or, you know, procured from the exact same source, 
make an herbal tincture of it, perform analytics on it, and then wait until after we add the salts and incubate that. And um, I've got kind of a, a it, I mean, it's not too proprietary. It's a pretty common thing. I think a lot of people would land on it if they just followed the prescriptions of incubating at 40 degrees Celsius. But one of the things that I've noted can really help change the, the, the nature of the solubility of, of the salts, or at least the potassium ion reaction that happens with the salts, is that um, you create a vacuum pressure with it. So it's important to heat it up to that 40 degrees Celsius, but just like canning something, taking it out of that environment and letting it cool down as well so that there's a certain vacuum pressure inside of the flask there seems to really help with that iatrochemical process, um, creating the, the potassium ion um, inclusion into that tincture. And, you know, we've seen with hemp that there are the creation of absolutely new terpenoids that did not exist before. So like we'll take, you know, a hemp tincture, take a look at it, run as many cannabinoid tests as we possibly can on it. And then after we do the spagyric process by adding the salts and doing this little vacuum trick, testing it again. And what ends up happening is that now there's delta 10 THC inside of the material, whereas before there's no presence anywhere in any of the analytical material for full spectrum cannabis or hemp that shows uh, yeah. delta 10 THC. And you know, we're seeing that a lot with a lot of other tinctures is that there are new uh, phytochemicals that are being present in this process. Do you have any anything to say to that or to add or elaborate on? Uh, they all do have their own fingerprints they will generate. But, uh, you know, one of the things in phytochemicals that's becoming big business is distilling. Um, you know, the old school dry distillation of, of herbs like I did in the temper of herbs uh, for the yeah. analysis, you, you take a dry herb and you distill it and it separates out into uh, four fractions. Um, and they're actually, it's becoming big business today because of biofuels. Yeah, uh, The whole industry of biofuels and um, chemical feedstocks that can be derived from taking uh, materials that they would otherwise dump, you know, say you buy walnuts, you know, shelled walnuts, there's somewhere there's a mound of walnut shells, you know, that, <laughs> that they're now distilling instead of pushing into a landfill uh, and distilling out, you know, phytochemicals, which are fuels, um, lubricants, medicines. Uh, and so that whole process is now becoming a big business. Um, and the other thing, on, on the plants, you know, they're finding so many things in cannabis, you know, that happen with cannabis uh, is because there's, they're throwing millions, if not billions of dollars at it. You know, if they do that to any other plant, they'll find similar things happening. Um, it's just, you know, there's an immense amount of money surrounding cannabis and everyone's analyzing it from every angle they can with, super high tech stuff, you know, if they do the same with Melissa or, you know, yeah. some other plant, uh, they're going to find similar uh, amazing things. Plants are amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they really are. They, I mean, you know, I've been trained and working with all of the different kingdoms, but the plants are still the things that are for me, the most accessible, the, the easiest to work with in many ways. They're the most forgiving, definitely possibly besides water. And they keep offering so much richness and diversity in terms of their healing effects. I mean, you know, we can take a single plant like St. John's wort and um, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the PON pharmacopoeia methods uh, that Jean Dubuis created too in his text, right? Yeah. So, yeah, their curriculum was almost identical with the PRS. Exactly. So with the Caraway Stone of Eternity, there was a huge opportunity there that I learned many, many years ago that can be employed with just about any herb, which is, you know, you make a tincture of the plant, but then you boil the, and, and then once you make that tincture, you distill out the ethanol, of course, and, and purge that ethanol that leaves you with the fixed sulfur of the plant, but then boiling that fixed sulfur then in water is really interesting because now you get 
water soluble and ethanol soluble fig sulfur versus just ethanol soluble fig sulfur. And in the case of St. John's wort now, we can take out some of those chemicals that like hypericin in particular, that would otherwise create contraindications for women on birth control, or there's, you know, people who are on lithium or, or other different types of SNRIs or SSRIs, and things like that. Yeah. yeah. And it, we can give them just the ethanol soluble stuff without having that high parison inside of there, which ends up producing a very similar effect to what St. John's wort should have, especially in increasing, drastically increasing the amount of vitamin D that becomes bioavailable to an individual yeah. um, without having any of those extra side effects. And so there's so many cool little tricks like this that can happen. And that's not even to go into all of the different other solvents. Um, yeah that uh, can be alchemically made that really make the herbs so rich and diverse and really, really useful for, for medicine today. So oh, yeah. I, I think it's- I've been, uh, I've been playing around with the, that fixed sulfur. Um, you know how you, you extract a plant and then you distill out the, the volatile, right? Mm -hmm. The mercury comes out, the alcohol. Uh, and with it, any volatile oil that the plant had, right. some plants don't have much, like, you know, Melissa smells great, but not a lot of volatile oil there. It has a fixed sulfur. Wow. Most of the plants wow. have a fixed sulfur. So instead of, you know, you distill out your mercury and you get down to that thick, they call it the vegetable honey. Yep. Um, yeah. Instead of burning that to get my salt of sulfur, I've been using uh, Isaac Collins advice where you re-dissolve it in distilled water and you'll see a bunch of crud fall down to the bottom. You collect that and put it aside and then you take the liquid, evaporate it back down to a resin, re-dissolve it in water and more crud will fall down, which you collect and separate with the first. And the liquid will become much more red and clear. And you do that cycle about well, four or five times and you'll end up with a ruby red resin. Um, and then all that crud that fell out, you burn that, calcine it, and you get your salt of sulfur from that. So now you have the fixed sulfur as this clear ruby red liquid. Um, and you evaporate that down, you get a resin, which they smell really nice. They have this nice earthy aroma. Some of them smell like you just want to eat them or push your face <laughs> in them. They smell so good. Um, but that's the fixed sulfur. Instead of burning that out, uh, I've been playing around with um, making vegetable stones using that fixed sulfur on plants that don't provide a lot of uh, the volatile sulfur. Yeah, well, and that's that's very much so along the same lines of uh, the caraway stone of eternity method of Dubuis. The only thing was is that with caraway, you don't get as much precipitation falling out. Um, you do see that with with certain herbs. In fact, you know, while we're talking about Melissa, that was one of Paracelsus' most favorite herbs. In fact, he he highly lauded its merits, and of course, he created the entire concept of a prima mens and wrote about prima mens Melissa as did other authors, perhaps even fictitiously, um, later on about some of its merits. Now, one of the things that Paracelsus, especially Paracelsian literature really talks about, the, the, he talks about spirit of wine a lot, dissolve something in a spirit of wine. And I think it's really important that we distinguish what Paracelsus was talking about as his spirit of wine, which in my opinion is probably a lot closer to John French's um, spirit of wine as well, in that it actually is somewhat of a mixture of water, ethanol, and diethyl ether. Is, is that kind of your own experience as well, following that work? Yes and no. Paracelsus had quite a few extraction media. Um, you know, Weidenfeld wrote a whole tract on it, you know, and Weidenfeld wrote the uh, secret wine spirit of the adept. Um, it's like a pretty large tome, but he he discusses in there all these different Paracelsian um, menstruums for extractions. And 
largely a lot of their takeaway is that he's using acetone derived from uh, acetate distillation uh, as one of the main ingredients. Um, but he has other alternate ones, which are mixtures, which can be uh, ether. They did have ether um, and like I say, acetone, um, alcohol and um, acetic acid. So in some cases there's ethyl acetate yeah. involved yeah. with ether, um, different combinations of these solvents. Um, provide different Paracelsian uh, menstrua. So uh, yeah, the one you mentioned, uh, I'm sure would be listed up there as a philosophic alcohol. Uh, yeah, now the method that I derived when I was reading, now realistically, and I'd, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. When I read Valentine, Basil Valentine's works, it seems like Basil Valentine is actually Paracelsian literature that's published posthumously under a different name, either because of the stigma of Paracelsian things or otherwise. What's your, what's your take on that? Do you think that that's a... That's, all, that's always been my opinion too. I mean, they they sound the same. They rave at the Medical Association the same. Yes. Uh, they have similar styles of writing. And, and the religious fervor and the reasoning is, is almost exactly the same. Yeah, and, and there's, there's been attempts to discover who Basil Valentine was, but uh, they've kind of fallen short. Um, you know David Shine, he was the yeah. uh, medical director out at uh, Paralab, and uh, he wrote his doctoral dissertation on uh, Basil Valentine and his tinctures of antimony, um, which has been republished, I, I noticed. Yeah. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Um, but in it, he spends a good half of the thesis looking at who Basil Valentine was and who was chasing after him uh, to find out who he was all through time. And uh, the takeaway is that it's vague. <laughs> yeah. There are some guesses. Uh, but the idea that Paracelsus and Basil Valentine were one and the same was is not new. There's been other people who have uh, suggested that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's and that's been <laughs> it stands to reason too because of the similarity of tone and style and and so many other things. So, with that being said, by putting together those two things, there were two things that were really important for me. One of which is that there are multiple circulated that Paracelsus used that he never gave recipes for in his own works that were published either during his life or posthumously that seem to make more sense when you look at Valentinian literature, like the fiery spirit of Basil Valentine, for instance, which seems to be, if I, I don't know if we could call it as such, but it's basically a uh, an incineration or a pyrolytic distillation of ethanol itself. Is that the way that you would describe that too? Pretty much, yeah. It's an oxidation, you uh, creating ether. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it seems like using those more non-polar solvents, uh, spe uh, specifically diethyl ether or the, the, the fiery spirit or the spirit of wine, the Paracelsian spirit of wine, it seems like those tend to produce a much higher quality uh, extraction when you're performing prima men's work than anything else because alcohol is still, even at 100%, it's still polar. Ethyl acetate, I don't know how you would describe ethyl acetate as either polar or non-polar, but it doesn't seem to be completely non-polar in its attributes. And that produces a slightly higher quality extraction in my opinion. Um, than does just 100% dried ethanol, but it doesn't seem to do quite the same thing as actually using a non-polar solvent. And, and same with acetone. Acetone produce, produces a slightly better extraction yeah. than dried ethanol, but again, not quite as well as the non-polars. Is that also your experience? Yeah, especially important with minerals. I mean, there's a whole scale, you know, you're starting with water as being very polar you know, up to alcohol, um, ethyl acetates above that, um, acetone, you go up and up to hexane, which is very, uh, you know, Extremely hydrophobic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole listing of, of solvents based on the, um, their polarity. 
And so uh, I think ethyl acetate is slightly above um, alcohol in being nonpolar. The more nonpolar we'll get, the more oily type resinous materials, uh, oils, things like that, um, that we want to pull out from plants and uh, minerals. You know, problem with minerals is that a small amount of water that you know could be in in your alcohol could dissolve a lot of poisonous mineral salts. You know, if you use Everclear, ninety five percent that five percent alcohol you're using uh, could dissolve potentially a toxic amount of you know uh, the mineral you're working on yeah so you want uh, something better acetone is a, a big step up from that uh, things like hexane will get even more volatile uh, oily materials out uh, so it's it's important especially for some of the mineral and metal works to have your solvents dried um, but it is important for the um uh, ends tincture too, like you mentioned, have a dry alcohol because um, that 5% is going to dissolve a lot of potassium carbonate. Yeah. You know, and if you uh, pull off your ends tincture, it's always a good idea to put it in the freezer uh, because the, the water that has dissolved the potassium carbonate, it has an electrical charge and the walls of the glass uh, vessel also have an electrical charge. And so when you put them in the freezer, the charges will migrate towards each other and the, um, the water containing potassium carbonate will crystallize on the surface of the glass. And then you quickly come in and pour off your tincture into another vessel and all that potassium carbonate crystal will be uh, left over in your glass. So it's a good idea to clean it up like that a couple of times. So, get rid of the excessive potassium. Yeah, even, do you think that that's even true when you're distilling it down to its prima mens form? Or do you think that there are iatrochemical reactions that could happen when it's in that prima mens kind of fixed sulfur state with the potassium carbonate? Or, or what are your, some of your thoughts on that? Uh, well, when you cook it down, if it has too much potassium carbonate, it will crystallize. Um, I. I took some premium ends, which was actually pretty purified and put a few drops on a glass plate to see how it crystallized. And I got the most intense vine. It looked like, I don't know, grape vines with leaves and things. I never saw crystals come out like that. Um, it was very unusual. Now, do you think that those were crystalline forms of various acids or do you think that that had anything to do with with uh, potassium salt crystallization? Uh, it's probably a combination of the two, you know, the plant acids. When the potassium goes in there, you know, the acids present become neutralized. Uh, right, so that's a base reaction. Different plant acids, you know, uh, say you have succinic acid or, or malic acid or even acetic acid present, um, they'll get neutralized and form the uh, potassium salt of that acid um, and those can crystallize out uh, in your salts when you put them on a plate or something like that. Wow, yeah, that's absolutely fascinating because realistically any of those substances that get made that are able to crystallize in, in that way are also going to have some sort of medicinal or therapeutic value, surely, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. But it's going it's to awesome. be different entirely than just making, say, like the ends tincture, like it, it, there's probably going to be differences in the medicinal actions of those things. Isn't oh, that? Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating to me. It, it just opens up the, the realm of spagyria. It seems like, you know, every time you encounter something new, or in my case, you know, the way that these new discoveries happen are mistakes, <laughs> you know, or quote unquote, accidental um, discoveries. It's interesting because it constantly is is driving the work and driving the art, and creating new new applications, new medicines that can be made from essentially the same process. It's just processed slightly differently. So yeah, yeah. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and take another break. Let's come back and uh, let's chat a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing with uh, Spagyricus, some of the things that you have coming up right now, 
and uh, how people can get in touch with you. So be sure to stay tuned, folks, and we'll be right back. Have you heard about our Spagyrics of the Month Club yet? As you probably know, we release five new Spagyrics each month. These range in the style of Spagyric Pharmacopoeia from tinctures, elixirs, essences, clysi, stones, and much more. But now, you can get your hands on all five new releases each month at just a fraction of the normal cost by being part of our Spagyrics of the Month Club. It's the very best way to inexpensively build your home Spagyric Apothecary, and it's also the best way to support our Research Academy. Participating is easy. Sign up for the $75 a month subscription on our website, and we ship you a four mil size of all five newly released Spagyrics that month. And shipping's even included for all orders within the USA. The best part is you just sign up once and sit back and receive your new Spagyrics delivered right to your door. It really doesn't get any easier. To get started or to learn more, go to phoenixaurelius.org and scroll down to the Spagyrics of the Month Club area on our homepage. As always, thanks so much for supporting our work. Well, we're back from the break. Again, we're here with Robert Bartlett. We've been chatting again about more of the practical alchemical aspects of things that are able to be done in the laboratory. If any of this talk is so over your head that you're having a hard time really comprehending it, you know, Robert has written a couple of books, which I mentioned earlier, you know, Real Alchemy, The Way of the Crucible. There's also other books that can help get you started in a lot of this work. Um, but his are really, really foundationally important because they expel in plain English the myths and the, the how shall we say, uh, obfuscations and obscurity that end up happening in a lot of uh, other works. And I think that they make it a little bit more uh, down to earth and easy for the practitioner. And also it comes from a direct lineage too of fraud or Albertus that, you know, did, did Albertus learn from Pincaldi? Is that who he practiced alchemy with initially? Do you know? No. I know he studied with the uh, Rosicrucians early on, 30s and 40s. Um, there was someone in Canada I heard he was in contact with. I don't know if it was a teacher. Uh, hmm. But as far as his background, I, I know only as far as back as the Rosicrucian work he was doing uh, in the 40s. Right. San Jose. Um, so, you know, what, what's really interesting about that, and I guess that would have been, uh, what was his name, Orson Greaves or Graves, who was teaching those classes? Yeah, Graves. Graves, yeah. So I was under the impression, and this could totally be not real, but I, if I remember right, uh, Rubafilo Salfluer had posted an alchemical pedigree many years ago, and it's since been withdrawn. And even at the time that he made it, he's like, I'm not sure that this is 100% correct. Um, but I think that he had listed there that Albertus's tradition had initially come, his awareness of it had initially come from Switzerland, where there was an Italian Swiss guy named Pincaldi. Um, and so, again, I don't know if there's any validity to that. I'm not sure if you'd ever talked to him about, about any of that. No, uh, and he never really brought it up. Uh, <clears throat> I heard, uh, actually, I heard Ruben Philo's past. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know actually too much about that. Um, but that would be surprising to me because he wasn't altogether too old. No, I, I was surprised to hear that myself. Um, I'm not sure it's 100% true, but I've heard it uh, from a couple sources. I know his website's down. But, uh, oh, wow. Unfortunate. I liked his writing. It was good. His writing was really good, man. Every student that I've ever worked with that has come to work with me, that who was a student of his, always said that he was just such a hard ass with, especially with his I heard, yeah. mystical. My kind of way or the highway kind of guy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I heard that, but still, you know, what he wrote was really good, I thought. Yeah, I did too. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And, you know, he had laid out, he was actually pivotal, you know, about a decade ago. Um, 
in posting a lot of information about alchemical works that was not widely published or talked about at that time. So I kind of looked at him as a, a groundbreaking fellow. And of course, today, there are a couple of people on the scene that I really look up to and, and like to work with as colleagues, Daniel Wiseman being one of them, Lynn, Lynn Osborne is another. Um, oh, yeah. It's you know, really good. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah. Shout out for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was surprised uh, at that. And um, also, the uh, PRS in Australia is now closed. Uh, Did Jeannie actually end up kicking the bucket? Yeah. Jeannie and uh, Rick Dannenberg uh, passed from COVID. Oh, wow. That is, you know. I, I know that you guys had a lot of uh, back and forth, <laughs> to put it politically correctly, over the years, but I, it doesn't bring me any pleasure at all to hear that they have uh, have passed on, although I'm sure that that makes things a whole lot easier <laughs> on your end for reasons we won't get into on this interview. But uh, yeah, that's that's really crazy, actually, to hear. You know, I, I had heard from other students of theirs as well who had come to work with me that they were making the the uh, prima mens melissa in very poor ways and taking it to the point where they were near deathly anyway and they had yeah. you know gray complexion and skin color and they just thought that that was what would happen before all their hair and nails would fall off and fall out and <laughs> eventually experience that renewal and it's like eh, i don't know there's not enough literature to talk about anything yeah. aside from from that to think that that should be the way that it goes but oh well <laughs> so you know let's let's not focus on all these other folks so let's talk about you and what you're doing so you know for how many years now have you been up and running with uh, Spagiricus Institute we started in 2003 yeah so just about 20 years that's absolutely fantastic, man. And um, you're still teaching prima, secunda, and tertia, right, as the classes. And then you also have like a breakaway antimony uh, class or weekend workshop that you're doing in addition to prima, secunda, and tertia these days. Is that correct? Yeah, we have actually a number of workshops we're going to start presenting uh, now that I'm retired and I have more time to do that. Um, Although you're supposed to get a break when you retire, I thought. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> so we have a number of workshops. We also have the Egyptian magic class, which has uh, yeah. become very popular. Uh, we also have the uh, Egyptian tour coming up uh, next year. Uh, that's right. I did actually see something about that. Now, it doesn't look like you have too much alchemical teaching to do in the class, or at least as the curriculum standard right now. So, so tell me a little bit more about that. How'd you get involved with that? Um, one of the students here suggested it and everyone was in on it. Um, she has a guide who's been doing it for 20 years, took over for Nikki Scully. Oh. Um, so she knows all the ins and outs and who to pay to get us into the temples. Um, as I understand it, you know, when you're walking around, you can't talk about it uh, unless you're an official guide. So you can't point out hieroglyphs and read them to the people and say, this is going on here and this is going on there. We have to do that in private somewhere else, um, uh -huh. talk about what we've seen. Um, but we can take pictures. We got guided tours through the different uh, temples all up and down the Nile there. So it, looks like it's going to be very interesting. It's filling up. We've got nearly the minimum right now, I think. Uh, 16 wow. was a minimum. And I think we're up to 14 or 15. But we can go up to 40 if there's interest, uh, is what I hear. So uh, if we get that many, it's cheaper for everyone, you know. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, as it stands right now, I think uh, I saw that it was somewhere in the seven grand price range um, for it. But you guys are visiting so many different sites. I was I was really impressed with the amount of sites. And how many days is it that you guys are? It's, are it's like two weeks. Yeah. And, you know, it's, that's lodging and food and, um, and the guided tour, you know, so. 
That's not bad. Be on a boat. It's a big boat cruise uh, for a large part of it. Uh, we have this big uh, boat that will take everyone, sleep everyone, as we drift down the Nile. <laughs> wow, that that sounds absolutely enchanting. Maybe something I I end up going on myself here if there's uh, room. It sounds like there there especially with room of up to forty. Um, so I just haven't solidified my travel plans and I'm assuming Egypt isn't very big on this whole COVID nonsense that's going on, uh, don't require vaccines and stuff or do they? I, I'm not sure. I don't, no, I don't know, actually. Well, uh, so we have to check out, you know, within the next year, um, but tourism is their main thing. So I'm sure they're lax on a lot of stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that a lot of other places are going to be before long too, because tourism just won't be as booming as uh, what it is if they don't restrict that. And of course, they're going to find out here really soon that, you know, with all the different quote unquote variants like Delta variants the, the, that they're talking about now and all this other nonsense, that uh, creating vaccines the way that they are is not going to be particularly effective. Maybe they should look instead towards alchemical medicines. Wink. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah, good luck with our theory I can... <laughs> <laughs> exactly so with that being said though robert um that that's really cool that you got that coming up your your egyptian uh, magic course was act absolutely fantastic by the way um i sat down and and did the entire thing in one day and it's so rich and so chewy that i've had to go back through it multiple times in order to, to get all of that. Is that kind of still part of your personal spiritual practice on the daily? Like, do you do the daily uh, temple work and the liturgy and things like that yourself? Well, not as I should, but you know, it's always uh, the background for things. Um, yeah. It's, well, yeah. It's varied. I'm married to the witch queen of New York, so. What can I say? <laughs> exactly. Well, I love the way, you know, maybe this is exposing too much detail. I hope not. But I love the way that you guys met, um, you know, an ad in the paper seeking high Egyptian priestess or something like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So you know, uh, my line of succession, actually, Karen actually is now the uh, official witch queen of New York in the uh, Welsh tradition. Wow, interesting. I didn't know that that was a, an actual title to be had. Yeah. Well, they take it very seriously in the East Coast, uh, witchcraft covens and all. Um, so I line of succession, the, the previous high priestess, uh, she died recently. So uh, Karen attended that funeral ceremony and she was, uh, dubbed as the the new witch queen by line of succession wow she was in, in the original coven of the uh, magical child out of new york there yeah yeah it, she and i have had a couple of talks about that before in the past it's fascinating though, that she's now dubbed the witch queen that's that's got to be pretty cool on the curriculum vitae yeah, yeah can i say the witch queen yeah exactly man I, if, if I ever get the chance to write your guys' biography, I think that'll be the title. <laughs> so, yeah, with that being said, though, uh, you know, your, your, your knowledge of hieroglyphics is actually pretty vast. I remember you showed me uh, the Book of the Dead, or at least a, a good portion of it, that you had yourself written in hieroglyphics by crushing up and making all of the pigments the way that they would have done historically speaking. So what's your knowledge of hieroglyphs today? Do you, do, would you say that you read them pretty, pretty damn fluently? Oh, I'd have to go review and, and study for the trip. You know, it's been a while. Um, I made that manuscript in the eighties. So mid eighties, I'd say. And I wanted to learn to read and write hieroglyphics and do some artwork. So I combined it all into one project and made a copy of the book of the dead and i have it right here i i just had it out the other day 
Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, that, that was one of the things that you had shown me that I think I was most impressed about. That was, that was really quite uh, an undertaking, especially to make your own pigments in order to do, do the entire thing uh, as a piece of art. But then also the scholasticism and academics that go into doing that, that's, that's just, it's always been an outstanding thing that I look at and just say, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I didn't have the internet when I made that. So I had to go to libraries multiple times at the University of Utah there. Yeah, that would have been an interesting uh, time to do that during your time in Utah. Did you get any weird looks while you were at the library looking up these Egypt things? Because there's not a lot of Egyptologists out here. <laughs> no, but I do remember going down some steps one time and I had an armload of books. It must have been like uh, nine or 10 books. And and some girl that passed me and goes, wow, you got a serious reading assignment. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is what I'm doing for fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's cool. So you've got a couple of classes, alchemy classes coming up, too. Uh, they're typically group classes, and you can hold, what, 10, 15 people or so inside the lab? You can hold a dozen people. You know, 10 is comfortable. After 12, it starts getting a little packed in there. Uh, yeah. Need to move move around a bit to do demos and uh, do class activities. So uh, sometimes Karen overbooks us, but we make it work out. <laughs> exactly. So uh, what, what are some of the ones that you have coming up next? We in uh, day after tomorrow, we have the Secunda class. Uh, we just did a Prima class, four days of verbal works. So, um, it's all about the introduction to alchemy, history, and theory behind alchemy. We start at the beginning. So if, if anybody is new, you know, we start at the very beginning for everyone. So we're speaking the same language. Uh, and then we go through simple demos with plants. We go out and harvest plants and process them. Um, and we end up with a, a tincture that everyone gets to take home, but also ways to make other tinctures and preparations, uh, more details on setting up your lab and doing things like that. Secunda continues. Uh, we go into the work on water, rainwater, um, work on salts, different uh, types of mineral salts. Uh, and then we get into the animal works. Um, and then we finish Secunda with minerals which are of animal origin, like shells and um, uh, feathers, uh, hoofs, hair, things like that, that contain minerals that have been processed by animals already. So in a sense, they're a step towards being humanized yeah. and uh, ready for medicines already. Uh, we process them a little bit further to make them uh, alchemically pure. Um, and then Tertia, which will be later in August, we get into the mineral and metallic world. So we introduce uh, mineral processes and uh, metallic works on uh, in the laboratory level. So lots of demos and uh, experiments that we do during the four days. Um, and people now we have trailers and things here. So most of the people camp on site. And so it becomes like a little, you know, a, a refuge or a, um, a little retreat area where everyone can stay here during the night because we have work going on in the lab pretty much yeah. when we get it going, it keeps going. Um, so there's all kinds of discussions going on late into the night, uh, reading books, uh, lots of materials here for study. So I bring books out and uh, even open up all my notebooks. People can look at my notebooks, take pictures, whatever they need. Um, it's all open books to them while they're here. So um, we encourage them to take advantage of that. Um, and then with the uh, end of Tertia, you know, we have a series of workshops on specific topics like uh, the antimony work, uh, metal acetates, uh, even oil of egg. Um, 
or um, doing spagyrics, simple spagyrics, uh, and creating your seven basics right here. You know, um, we've got enough herbs growing around here that we can get all seven planets uh, together pretty easy. So, uh, series of workshops that are coming up as well. That's absolutely fantastic, man. I'm I'm so glad to hear that. You know. One of the things, you know, especially since I have dropped off of, of doing a lot of public classes so that I can focus on my research, a lot of people will always ask me like, well, where can I learn this? And it's like, well, Robert Bartlett, he's, he's always offering information. And in fact, you've, <coughs> you've even got Prima, Secunda, and Tertia on DVD as well. So uh, that's a really great opportunity for people who aren't able to go and study in person with you. Uh, who may find it cost prohibitive or whatever in order to make the journey across the United States or whatever else to be able to still access the information. And so I think that it's amazing. You're one of the most generous teachers with the time, the information, the sincerity. Um, and you have a certain knack in my experience for answering people's questions at the level from which they're asking it which I think is one of the most important things because it's really easy to go over people's heads. <coughs> and a lot of, you know, lesser experienced teachers and instructors will do that. Somebody will ask a question somewhat innocently and receives this answer where it causes their, gla their eyes to glaze over. Whereas you can, you know, answer from where the point from where they're asking it. And, and if they ask with a little bit more depth, then you can answer that same question with more depth. And so I find it to be a really useful experience. And probably, you know, I don't think that there's many people in the United States that have nearly the amount of years of alchemical experience that you do, and certainly not from a professional perspective. And even if they did, certainly not also having the analytical background and the chemical background, uh, you know, from, from chemistry basis to help understand a lot of these things in more modern terms as well. And so I think that, you know, my own take is now and always has been that you're just a wealth of information that you know, everybody should try and extract, if they're interested in alchemy, they should try and extract from you everything that they possibly can uh, during the time that, that you're still here on this earth, because once you're gone, unless you write it all down, <laughs> it's, it's gone. It's, you know, you're just a wealth of information there, Robert. Well, I have all those books to write, so hopefully uh, that'll keep me busy for the next 60 years or more. Yeah, exactly. Well, as long as you're taking that stone, then <laughs> extending that lifespan. So, yeah. So, Robert, currently you have Real Alchemy, The Way of the Crucible, The Temper of Herbs that are already published books that are out. You also have a book on antimony that, that if I'm not mistaken, I think I already placed a pre-order for it. So the work is underway. Is there any side of when that will be published? End of July here. It was supposed to come out. Um, really? For real. And then uh, we have planned other ones, of course. Uh, not sure which order to do them in. Got a lot of notebooks to go through. But also pictures to merge, you know, with the notes. So I have pictures on my computer to merge with my lab notes and things like that. So I'm really the only one who could do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so it's good to get everything scanned in so I can start doing that and getting it all organized. Yeah, so is that what the majority of your days are looking like now or just kind of spent putting things together in preparation for, for publishing? Um, to some degree, I've been taking a break. Good. <laughs> uh, doing classes and filling orders keeps me busy. Um, but uh, I've been hiking around a lot. <laughs> Very good. And you guys still have horses? We do. Oh, we have good. Two, uh, two gypsy banner horses and a Mustang. Oh. Term a number of bunnies. <laughs> yep. Three cats and a dog. That's so amazing. Yeah. A lot of animal love up in your household and up there on the, the Spagyricus ranch, so to speak. It's more, it's definitely more of a ranch than I would say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's actually, you... uh, Soluna Ranch. Soluna Ranch. That's right. That's right. So, 
All right, cool. Well, uh, is there anything else that you have coming up that you would like to let anybody else know about? Uh, well, if you're interested, uh, our website is uh, spagyricus.com. Uh, you can look for announcements for classes or anything like that. And that would be good. Absolutely. And there's a number of really good products on there too. I mean, I, I can wholeheartedly stand behind. I know that there are other people out there who are producing or claiming to produce the oils of the metals and doing a wide range of them. And even though I absolutely applaud their efforts, um, Robert's work is bar none, the absolute best. And it's the most matured as well. Like he, like we kind of were talking about earlier, when you make something brand new, it has different chemical properties to it than something that is aged and it, it makes a huge difference. And so you have, you know, 40 or almost 50 year old age oil of gold and silver available, right? Yeah. Most of the metals. Yeah, that's, that's exceptional. So you, you also have oils of some of the other metals available on the website. Oh, not on the website, but as samples that I've been analyzing, you know, over the years, uh, oils of copper, iron, lead, uh, zinc, tin, um, platinum, mm -hmm. silver, gold, mercury. Yep. <laughs> Whole list of suspects. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. Um, and then, of course, you know, anybody who, who knows and has worked with me as a client, most of the, the people that I'm referring to your site regularly are individuals uh, that need biochemical cell salts, again, because they were made a very long time ago under alchemical circumstances, a PRS, if I understand right. And yeah, yeah, it's the same line developed at, P at the PRS, um, you know, as as the chief chemist, part of my job was to keep samples of everything we put out. And so, you know, I have mass samples of antimony, uh, the, the homeopathic cell salts, I had the mother tincture. Mm -hmm. So uh, enough to dilute out to, uh, I, I think I calculated 5 million gallons of each cell salt uh, on the homeopathic, you know, 7X. So that's, been going for quite a while, uh, but we also have in mind some other products. We're going to develop a line for animals. <laughs> surprise. Yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, so uh, Karen has some ideas for uh, animal spagyrics, um, but on the homeopathics, um, you know that Ryland went out of business. They were like the number one homeopathic sales. Uh, so we're, we're getting a lot of overflow from them. That's good uh, to hear. But also, there's a, we had a doctor in New York. He's been using cell salts for years, you know, over 20 years experience. And, and he started using our salts and he was like blown away. He's, these are far superior yeah. than anything he's tried before. Um, he noticed a big difference uh, in the <laughs> spagyric cell salt or the standard milk sugar tablet kind. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a nice, it's, I mean, to talk about night and day difference, it's not even that. It's like the di planetary differences <laughs> and the difference between night and day and that, um, you know, the most milk tablet. Uh, it's always nice to get. Say that again. Yeah, it's always nice to get validation like that, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a huge difference. I'm constantly referring people to your site for, for cell salts in particular. Um, you also have some oil of egg and a few other products on there. Um, so... Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, anybody who's looking for some really good, high quality alchemical medicines from somebody who really knows their shit, spagyricus.com is a wonderful outlet for those. And of course, you know, they don't carry the same, uh, it's not a huge pharmacopoeia because that's not, you know, a production facility with just one person <laughs> is a very difficult thing to produce uh, and to make feasible, but there is plenty of uh, choice and options that Robert still has and the products that he, he does carry are absolutely fantastic. So I, I strongly endorse all of the spagyricus.com products. Oh, you also have ruby, ruby emerald, diamond, uh, gem essences too, right? Yeah, we make them differently. Um, actually, these were a request from someone we were supplying and 
and they were expecting the, you know, you take a gemstone and you put it in a water alcohol mixture and you, you expose it to moonlight for a few hours and then that's your gem elixir. Um, we did it a little differently where we took the gemstone and uh, took an equal weight of the oil of silver, silver being, you know, the perfect reflector or medium. Um, and those were exposed to concentrated moonlight through a, a big Fresnel lens um, for several hours and then diluted one to 10. And then that was exposed to moonlight uh, through a lens. And then, and then another succussion uh, dilution out. Um, so a strong exposure in each of the um, dilution phases up to the um, 5X level, 6X level. Um, so they're constantly blasted with the uh, moonlight, you know, with the gemstone still present. That's absolutely cool. Yeah, I was, uh, when I first got them, I, I didn't read how it was made. I mean, I, it did say on the label that it was used as, uh, with the oil of silver as an extraction medium, or as a transfer medium, actually, was I think the way that that was phrased. And I thought, geez, I don't know how he's doing that, because the method that I was familiar with was actually using, uh, it was with the, what John H. Reed had written about, about making, you know, like uh, essence of rose quartz or whatever using and <clears throat> ethyl acetate or the vegetable alcohol. Yeah. And so um, that's kind of what I thought that I was getting. I was pleasantly surprised when I got it. I was also kind of surprised by the flavor too. I was like, hey, this, this doesn't taste like that, but it's uh, it's a whole different product and it's got a whole different uh, effect to it. So I think that it's a very unique way of going about producing um, a, a quote unquote gem elixir, even if it isn't, you know, the traditional alchemical pharmacopoeia, it's definitely yeah. still a very potent and cool product. Yeah. Well, Karen also had a vision one time of a, um, a, a gem elixir, which he, she calls the initiatic elixir. And this is a ruby gem elixir, which is spiked with gold oil. Oh yeah. She had this in a vision, uh, when she was meditating that, you know, we needed to make this. So we also offer the initiatic elixir with the uh, gem elixirs, uh, emerald, ruby, and diamond. Wow. That's, so that's we maybe expanding so cool. that line. Super cool. Well, Robert, man, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. I, I especially love picking your brain, talking about, you know, some of these deeper lab processes and lab works that you just can't talk with too many people about. Well, everybody, thank you again for listening. If you really enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, hit subscribe, hit the bell notification if you're watching on or listening to this on, on YouTube. Uh, if you're not, please just know that these uh, types of interviews actually take a lot of time for Nori and I to be able to put together. They are free productions. The best way that you can support us is by going to our website, uh, possibly purchasing a few things from our apothecary. Of course, you can sign up for the Spagyric of the Month Club, or uh, we have lots of other ways that you can uh, help us as well, especially just by spreading the word. So again, if you like this, be sure to help us get it out, like it, share it with friends, so on and so forth. Again, thank you so much on behalf of all of us from Alchemiculture. Have an absolutely fantastic night. Yeah.